Uh, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Um, let me get you the, uh, the, the presentation is on this one. Let me load this. It's uh, change form one. Thank you. Um, I, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I prefer talking without a mic um, because I taught at Oxford for 17 years and they don't give you a mic. They make you shout because they've been doing it that way for 700 years. So they don't change. <coughs> they never change. And one of the things that we'll talk about today is change and how do you manage change. And uh, as European business people, uh, you will be experiencing change coming from overseas. And that's, that will, that's my little bit of warning uh, for what will happen in the next 20 years. Uh, and now I'll explain the, the reasoning behind that. This one? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay. Two seconds. Nope, <laughs> great. Um, I'll start a little plug for my book. Um, it's a new book. It's out, uh, sadly, only in English at the moment. Uh, there's no French copy yet uh, or German. Uh, it's in Japanese in November, but the English edition is out now. Um, I was uh, honored to interview uh, senior executives from 50 of the world's largest companies uh, over the past two years uh, from 16 different nationalities. Uh, my research was funded by KPMG Consulting, and they arranged for me to, thank you. Um, can we go, uh, is there a, a clicker? Or, perfect, right. Um, so I, KPMG Consulting um, sponsored my research, and I interviewed chief executives from 16 different nationalities, and heads of uh, strategy, finance directors, and chairmen. So I'll talk about a little bit about the background of that book first and the research. Then I'll talk about some of the trends in globalization because they are going to lay the foundation of what I'll discuss next. And then I'll talk about uh, characteristics of what I call entrepreneurial giants. These are companies that are not lazy. And they are ones that are be very innovative, uh, very quick, very fast decision making and they're growing very, very rapidly. And they are not European and they're not American. And most of them are not Japanese either. They're from the emerging world. And uh, then I'll give you a, a one example, JBS of Brazil. Uh, I think their turnover, they're growing so quickly it's hard to find, figure out what their turnover is, but I think at the moment it's about $38 billion a year. Um, and next year it'll probably be $42 billion. It's growing that quickly. So, oh, oh, fantastic, thank you. Oh, no, it's fine. I'm the gray one, fantastic, thank you. Oh. There we go. Oh. <laughs> Technology is not my thing. That's why I have children. <laughs> that went perfect, thank you. Okay, so this is a little background of the book. These are the companies I interviewed. Um, I'll let you just go through those, I won't read them off. They varied in size. I think the largest was probably Cargill, privately held group in the United States. They turned over $120 billion a year. Um, the, uh, and some of the small ones only turned over $10 billion a year. So they were all very large companies. Um, it was also a mix of publicly public companies, uh, privately held companies, uh, ARC International, uh, makers of Luminarc, from France, I interviewed them. Um, we had some state-owned enterprises uh, in the mix. Japan Tobacco, 60% state-owned. Um, and we also had developed an, emer an emerging world. Um, so to give some background, what I talked about with them was my, my interest has always been mergers and acquisitions. I did my doctorate in mergers and acquisitions and I'm fascinated by what happens to employees when one business buys another. But my view has expanded. And now it's how do companies go global? How do they expand from one country to another? And it, acquisition is just one mechanism. You can use a joint venture. You can do a greenfield investment. Why do you choose one way? Why do you choose that country to enter? So all of these became questions I asked these chief executives. But before I did that, I did some research on what are the trends happening in the world today. And the first one, and this was very clear when I interviewed CEOs, Europe is not growing. 
Eastern Europe is growing some, but it's not growing the way the developing world is. America, big as it is, is not growing. China is growing. Indonesia is growing. India is growing. South America is growing. So all of these companies were focusing on the emerging world. Uh, different countries for different reasons, and I can talk about that uh, as well, but they, they were all looking at the emerging world. Their focus was going to be the emerging world. Um, so that was one trend. The other one is, is something called global focusing, and I'll come back to that because that's actually very important. What's happening is companies 10 years ago, um, I wrote an article in the Financial Times saying one third of the British top 100 companies were divesting enormous divisions because they were starting to look at the world as a market and they had to pick what they wanted to concentrate on in that global market and they didn't have the resources to do everything. So they picked what the, is their key business and they got rid of everything else. Now what that did is it created a lot of great targets for acquisitions and the emerging world and other companies have really used that to grow globally. Uh, and uh, you can look at some of the companies. Lafarge bought a very large company in uh, the Middle East based on that. Um, about 15% of the companies I interviewed had done this, had bought something which I call a transformational acquisition. It gives you an enormous footprint somewhere where you need it abroad in another country. So that, that will play into, we'll come back to that. So we're seeing, because of global focusing, we're seeing transformational acquisitions where you can get an acquisition that fundamentally changes your business overnight. And that's a really rare opportunity. <clears throat> it may never happen in your business's lifetime. It may happen once. I don't know if it can happen twice. I've never seen it twice. Um, and we're starting to see emerging market targets and acquirers. Again, I'll come back to this because this is important for innovation. It, trust me. Um, so what we're seeing is we're seeing a changing in terms of who are the big players and where they operate. So um, I don't have the statistic on the top of my head, but roughly 15, 20 years ago in the top 100 largest companies, maybe three were from the emerging world. Now it's more like 15. And it will be, I guarantee, in 10 years it will be 30. So that means that developed world companies are falling out of the top 100, being replaced by emerging world companies. And I'll tell you why. Now, this goes back to global focusing. Um, it used to be uh, we had conglomerates. Conglomerates went out of fashion. Uh, the stock markets don't support them anymore in the developed world. So you're running towards, you're, you're moving away from being in one country with lots of companies to being in one uh, product in lots of countries. So it's a flip. And that's happening more and more at the moment. Again, the, the developed world is, is following this. The developing world, not all. So developing world, we have, say, Arcelor Mittal. We have JBS. They are in one industry. But we have groups like uh, LG Group, Samsung, uh, that are still conglomerates. Indian groups are still conglomerates. And it's, I, don't under, I haven't looked into an, why that is the case uh, very much. But this is important because it means that, that there are very attractive developed world targets becoming available that emerging groups are starting to buy. And also developed groups are buying. Now, this is to make sure you're awake, uh, this slide. What this is, is just to give you an indication of how much activity is taking place in the emerging world. Because you don't realize how many acquisitions, mega deals, over a billion dollar in value deals are taking place in the emerging world. It's about one third. And what I've done is just to show you a breakdown of how, what, what this is. This next slide gives you more detail. But just to point out, um, what, I'm in, what you should focus on is the top three colors. The bottom color is where you have the developed world and a developed uh, acquirer and developed target. What we're interested in is those top three. Those are where you have an emerging world buyer, seller, or both. Okay. So at the moment, we're seeing the most activity in that arena where you have emerging world companies buying emerging world companies. But then you're also seeing an increasing amount of 
uh, emerging world companies buying in the developed world, that green, green, lime green color. And you're going to see that number get bigger and bigger in time. If you see in the early part of the uh, millennia, there's that, that's very small. It's getting bigger, and it will continue to get bigger. And this is just a breakdown of those, uh, those numbers. As you see, uh, the developing world acquirer is, in the beginning, was running at 1.6, 3%, 2.5. It's getting bigger now, running between you know, 65 to 4%. And again, I don't have this year's figures, but I'm sure they're going to be higher. But it, you see, 22% of activity, it doesn't even involve the developed world. It's a developing world acquirer, an emerging world acquirer buying an emerging world target. Again, there's a reason for telling you all of this. So let's talk a little bit about those emerging world globalizers, those emerging world companies that are growing internationally very quickly. They're used to dealing in the emerging world and all that entails. They're used to political instability. They are used to corruption and how do you deal with corruption. Uh, they are used to things taking longer. They're used to having no infrastructure. Uh, they're used to having to manage many, many stakeholders. Developed world companies are not as good at this generally because they haven't had to do it all the time. They're used to having the structure of a developed world. Um, emerging world globalizers are used to operating with limited resources. They, in the past, had no money. They had currency uh, exchange issues uh, in many cases. Um, they didn't have good technology. They didn't have management that had international experience. They didn't have a lot of resources that you need to grow internationally quickly. So what they did is they partnered with companies that did have what they needed. So if you didn't have international experience, you partner with, or experience in that country, you partner with a, with a company that does have experience in that market. So they're very good at joint ventures. Uh, and they're very good at successful joint ventures. And there's a difference. They are very creative in their use of resources and their partnering. And this was something I saw across the board. It didn't matter if you were South American, African, Asian, uh, if you were an emerging market globalizer, you had very clever use of partnering. And strange partners, not someone you would think of immediately. Sometimes a competitor in another market. It's called coopetition. We'll talk about that more. Very clever use of partnering. Uh, they had a really strong senior management decision-making ethos. Usually there was a founder. The companies tended to be younger, although JBS is a 75-year-old company. They tended to be uh, younger, often with the influence of the founding family still there. So there was very quick decision making, a very strong centralized decision making. Uh, and they had a very strong use of international management team of entrusted employees. They, the team didn't tend to be necessarily the same nationality as the company, but they tended to be long-term employees who knew the company culture inside and out and were very passionate about that culture. Um, and I'll talk about JBS uh, as an example, but I have other examples. Um, they tended to be younger, younger uh, certainly in their international experience, and because of that, they tended to have newer technology in terms of communication. And again, uh, one of their characteristics, amazing communication systems inside the business. So you have something that I would call the entrepreneurial giant. Um, they are a company that, uh, again, they tend to be emerging world globalizers. There were a couple Japanese companies that showed some of the tendencies. Uh, Teva Pharmaceuticals, which is Israeli, largest generic uh, pharmaceutical company in the world. Technically, that's not an emerging market, according to the United Nations, but they act like one. 96% uh, of their turnover comes from outside of Israel. Um, they have demonstrated a meteoric rise in growth over the past 20 years. Amazing growth rates that are not slowing down, even though some of these companies turn over $40 billion a year now. Um, and th but they still operate like a small company. They still have the decision-making capability and the innovation of tiny, tiny, $200 million companies, say, not a 10 or 20 or $30 billion a year company. 
And the way they've done it is they have certain characteristics on how they do it. And now, even more so, they have resources. They have lots of money. They have lots of management talent. And they have great technology now. So how have they done it? The first thing that I, I noticed in these companies, and this was never my research uh, area. I was looking at mergers and acquisitions, and I just stumbled across this when I interviewed these companies. Um, they have incredibly fast decision making, very autocratic systems in terms of understanding the hierarchy of decision making. If you want a decision, you know who you have to get to, and they make a decision. It's not necessarily the CEO. But you know who the right person is. Um, they, the thing that was really interesting was the autonomy of the local management. Again, it may not be the CEO in your parent company. It may be the CEO of your, uh, your subsidiary. But that person has total autonomy. And the reason why they are given total autonomy is because they are a trusted member of the management team who's trusted by the senior management team. And they are given total authority. And they know to do what's right for the company because they tend to be a long-term employee. Um, they had amazing communication systems, internal communication systems. Uh, the Indian groups I talked to, every group had video links between every office that they had worldwide. So they could have a senior management meeting and get everybody up on a video screen across, across the world. I didn't find that in the developed world. They used other ways to communicate with each other. But they, the, the, these small, these small, they're not small now. These, these emerging market groups have amazing communication systems and they know they can talk face to face, at least through Skype or, or other video conferencing, with anybody in the world. And they, that face to face, being able to see their face on a screen at least, makes a big difference on knowing who to talk to if you have an issue or need something solved. No, it's not an email thing. It's a face-to-face it's a -face communication thing. Um, they had incredibly sophisticated knowledge centers and management centers. They knew where the knowledge was sitting in the organization. When you talk to the big groups, uh, they would often have a knowledge center with 100 people in it. They couldn't even figure out the knowledge within those 100 people. And, and they were the smart ones who at least had narrowed it to 100 people. These emerging market groups, had, if they had a knowledge center, sometimes they were virtual, but they all were on, on video link to each other and could see each other and talk to each other face to face. They knew where the knowledge sat in the business. And they were very creative in their partnering. Again, Teva, pharmaceutical, they are big enough now they could develop their own in-house uh, marketing teams that would, could be some of the best in the world. They partner with Procter & Gamble. And they said, why should we develop a marketing team when we can use Procter & Gamble's and they're the best in the world? And it's cost them millions of dollars, if not billions, to build that team. Let them do it. We'll concentrate our resources and time on other areas where we can add real value. Um, they had a culture that supported and rewarded this kind of behavior. The motto, the mantra at JBS is keep it simple. Just keep it simple. To the point where the person that I interviewed, I interviewed uh, Hector Batista, the CEO, and then I interviewed uh, another gentleman in the firm who's probably, who's top five managers in the firm. His email address is his first name at jbs.com. That's it, first name. Simple. That's how, and I, when I read his email address, I said, is that really your email address? And he laughed and he said, we all have email addresses like that. It's just that simple. We don't get complicated here. And they, they all had this whatever, the, one of the other groups, uh, uh, GMR of um, India, uh, their group was, we want to make a difference. We want to make a difference. We, we offer the whole package. We're good corporate citizens. Uh, we want to offer, a, we want to make money, but at a good price. We want to give back to the community. And uh, again, very simple, very simple ethos of what they offer internationally. And they stick to it. And they reward people who support that ethos or culture. And they came up with some very unusual, out of the box thinking. And I'll just talk about a few of those. First one is, they, they, because historically they did not have the management uh, depth 
that they could go in after an acquisition and just start firing people, which is traditionally what happens. Um, they, they had to work with the management team that was there because they simply didn't have the people to replace anyone they fired. So their view is we will partner with our acquisition targets and not try to impose on our acquisition targets. So they partner with their acquisitions, almost like a joint venture arrangement. They find the areas that they really want to work on, they put all of their effort into those, and they forget about the rest. And it, a great example is, is Tata, when they bought Jaguar. So Jaguar is part of Ford, who I also interviewed for the survey. And Ford loses a billion dollars a year, uh, every year, with Jaguar. Tata has them, and within one year, they make $650 million. So that's almost a $2 billion swing. And they said, we want, we let Jaguar management just run. We gave them financial targets and we talked with them about collaboration and we wanted certain elements of Jaguar for our other cars. And that's what we concentrated on and then we let them run the business. Very successful. Very common in emerging market acquirers. They do this, this thing called coopetition. Now, JBS, it just made me laugh because they were the first one of the emerging companies I interviewed. And uh, after Hector Batista flew to the United States after they had bought Swift, which was two times bigger than they were, um, he went, uh, and we'll talk about them in a minute, but we talked, he, he went to go see all the competitors to say hello and introduce himself and say, you know, we look forward to working with you in the future and, you know, competing against you. And all the competitors thought he was crazy. I thought he was crazy. And the, some people said, oh, you're going to lose in this market. You're going to do really badly. Well, you know, within eight months, the business had totally turned around and it was very successful. And the, that one CEO that said how badly he was going to do actually came back and apologized. Um, but you never know. In one market, you may be a competitor. In another market, you may cooperate. Um, Heineken in uh, Africa partners with uh, one of the Diageo brands against um, SAB Miller to try because they have a 90% market share. So they work with Namibia breweries, Heineken and a Diageo brand. And of course the Diageo brand and Heineken are big competitors in Europe, but they work together in Africa uh, in an emerging market because they have no choice. Um, so that's the kind of thing you find with this coopetition. Emerging market companies are fabulous at this. They are amazing. Um, they are great corporate citizens. They all have foundations. They all give a really large percentage of their money back to the local community. And it's not, I, I think it's part of it is because they come from a place in the world where they, they understand how fortunate they are to do well and they want to give back. So again, GMR Group of India, when they built the Maldives airports, the first thing they said when they won the contract is, what do you need from us? We do infrastructure. We can build you a hospital. We can build you a school. We can build you lots of schools. What do you want? They had already won the contract. They didn't use this to bribe winning the contract, but they have a reputation now in the industry of giving back to the local community. And that's not just emerging market. IMAX did it in China very, very successfully. Um, uh, other companies do that, so they're not the only ones. Mitsubishi Chemicals does that. They have a foundation. But, but the emerging market companies all do it. So they get a reputation for being a good corporate citizen. Um, they are phenomenal networkers. They will, because they didn't have the resources in the past, they are amazing at networking. They, they, you never know when someone you meet will be able to help you in the future. So they talk to everybody which is a little unnerving, but, but it's, uh, again, amazingly successful. Um, they're very good at testing the water with low risk strategies. They love joint ventures because you get to know it, and maybe in a, even a small area, small geography. You get to know the partner, you get to know the, the geography, the culture of the region, and then you invest more and more. This idea that you go in and, and completely change things immediately, is something they don't, they don't like. They like long-term trusting relationships. Um, and they're very good at managing them now because they've done them so much. Um, and now they're starting to buy brands. 
They've now got the money. They've always had bad technology relative to the developed world. Now they're starting to buy brands. And you will see this more and more. China is sitting on $3 trillion of surplus right now. And they're not investing it in China because China's starting to slow down. So they are going to go out into the developed world and start buying big brands. So Coca-Cola someday could be Chinese. You know, it's, uh, you know, I think you're more likely to see Louis Vuitton be Chinese. They, they love brands, and it, they, they're starting to do it now. So again, we've started to see this. Ulker, the, the Turkish group, bought Godiva. That's, that seems almost heresy to me, that, that Godiva is not European. But it's not, well, is Turkey European? Um, so you look at that. So it's happening more and more. Um, and finally, they break the rules. Whatever the rule is, they break it because they just are so innovative. So global focusing is companies are selling and getting out only into core business except for Indian groups, South Korean groups, some of the Brazilian groups. You know, they, they, whatever the rule is, they don't follow the rule. So they, don't, they, they are unpredictable. So let me give you, before I do that, let me give you a case study. JBS, the first ones I interviewed that, that showed this pattern. They, uh, Brazilian food processors, they are the largest food processors in the world now. Um, their turnover is about 40 billion, on, you know, it changes all the time, it just keeps growing. Um, they bought Swift, which was twice as big as they were in the US, they were Brazilian. They, the only international experience they had was they had bought a couple things in Argentina, um, but they had never bought anything in the English speaking world. Um, so the CEO moved, he left running Brazil to one of his uh, trusted lieutenants and he moved to the United States. He, didn't, he spoke no English. He learned English and personally interviewed every senior executive while he was learning English um, because he said the Brazilian business is safe. That's running really well. The, right now the risk is the United States so I need to be there. So he went there with this, uh, an Irish man Who's, who ended up running it after he left. Um, so um, he took four layers of management out. Swift had, had so many layers of management, it took you nine layers to get from the shop floor managers to the CEO. So if you wanted to make a decision, you know, two years later, you get a decision. He took out, so, he took out half the management layers. And he just said, this is crazy. We, do, this is, we, we, we process chickens. This is not nuclear power. We don't need that many layers. So he fired a lot of people. Um, but the business turned around. It started making money, finally. It has grown. It's doubled in size since they bought it four years ago. And it's far more efficient. He just said, they kept saying, just keep it simple. This is processing chickens. OK? So, he put this Irish employee in place to run the, who had been a JBS employee for 20 years. He put him in place to run the operation. Uh, and then he let him run it. He just left him alone. And so Jerry, the, the employee, could call the CEO anytime he needed something. But he was given total autonomy to run it. And it was wildly successful. He met with the competitors, as I said, to see where they could collaborate. Met with some skepticism. but. Um, and they met their two-year performance objectives in 10 months. That's successful. Now, part of that was cutting cost, but it was really enhancing decision-making speed. And the management teams at the top are so uh, tight that if they have an issue, they can call somebody else and they do video conferencing and everything else. So they know everybody. So it means that things are very, very speedy. So in summary, these entrepreneurial giants are the future. They are just growing so quickly, uh, and they are becoming the standard for innovation. They are all operating in the emerging world, which is also growing quickly, which helps them. Um, and they will, in time, start to come in the developed world and buy things. Um, now, some developed world globalizers are starting to mimic some of these attributes because they see how successful they are. And I'll give you an example. Japan Tobacco did this. When they went international, they went international in 1989. They were a state-owned enterprise. But they, um, they moved when they, they bought, they had a transformational acquisition. They bought uh, R.J. Reynolds' international business. 
and they moved their head office to Switzerland because they said, we can't run a global Japanese business from Japan when we have a 60% market share and we're a state-owned enterprise. It just won't work. Different systems, processes. And basically, they have, uh, they waited for a little while, got that settled. But within 13 years, they now operate in 120 countries. And they have completely different systems that operate in Switzerland than they do in Japan, which is 60% domestic market share um, in a large and stable economy. Um, their board of 16 people has 12 nationalities represented. ArcelorMittal, if you look at some of these global boards of emerging market, they know they can't run this like an Indian company anymore. So their actual senior management board is still pretty Indian in Spanish, French, Liechtensteinian because of Arcelor. But if you look at their management board, it's wildly international. Very, very, you would have no idea what company it is. So that's, that also comes out of this. Um, I will predict, and this is the bad news, entrepreneurial giants will grow faster than US, European, Japanese companies for the next 20 years. So unless the developed world companies start to mimic the entrepreneurial emerging world companies, they are going to be past, just, uh, just not even close, they are just going to be past. Um, and it's already starting to happen. There are very few American, European, Japanese companies growing a $40 billion a year, growing at 15% a year. There are quite a few of these guys are doing it. So, and it's not just because they operate in the emerging world, it's because of the way they operate in the emerging world that this is happening. So that's the bad news. So I'm really sorry to start off today with bad news, but that's the bad news, so. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Nancy. Uh, well, good news, bad news. Uh, mostly it's 50-50. Uh, and if we start with, uh, with bad news, maybe we have also good news today. <laughs> so thank you. And I think that uh, you realized uh, that uh, she was not only uh, a substitute. So uh, thank you, Nancy. <laughs> We have a few minutes left if you have uh, directly questions now uh, from the plenary. Uh, if not, then I invite you to join the workshop this afternoon with Nancy. But if you have questions, if, if, not, if not, then, then I think uh, it's good to, to go now from, uh, let me say, an uh, overall view that you have uh, given uh, to a very specific uh, case and uh, therefore uh, I'm uh, very happy that uh, Rafael Zaccardi is among us. So thank you, Nancy. Pleasure.